where I, we were here last time on Monday. Where is the signal input? The theater. <laughs> it's not playing movies, it's playing circuits. <laughs> Yeah, sample in, right? And, you know, that's uh, the pass gate. Remember, PG? The difference between the pass gate and transmission gate is, remember the transmission gate you used in your MUX? You have a PMOS and NMOS doing that job at the same time. But the pass gate only has one NMOS. And so the signal here is supposed to be pass. It's supposed to pass the pass gate and reaches this point. So the capacitor here is just a, a low pass filter. So it's going to hold that voltage and remove all the high frequency stuff. Um, however, you know you are thinking like if we have a pass gate, the signal should be able to pass the pass gate and reach to VL. So I'm able to sample the input already. Why do we need everything else over here? A lot of other circuits. So that's a sampling circuit. If I turn on, turn off this gate, I should be able to pass this signal to here. So why do I still need all these circuits? Hmm? Not to time it, it's just for, you can connect the clock to the gate, right? You can time it here. So you have the clock over here, control the other circuits. Yeah, so I mentioned, if you, if you do not simulate yourself, you cannot, um, Remember that, you know, so the purpose of everything here is to make a constant VGS. Keep in mind. Because sample in is going to change. It's a input signal. It varies. So if you just turn it on, usually what's the voltage to be applied to the gate to turn it on? Just turn it full, fully on, right? BDD. Just give a high voltage. So it's going to turn on the NMOS. However, the sample in, which is a input signal, varies. So that's why VDD, so the VG minus VS varies as well. So it's having an inconsistent VGS, which causes problems. So what are the problems? We're still studying that, right? So uh, in, the, in the senior sum team, I want to see like how we can visualize the nonlinearity being caused by an inconstant, a consistent uh, a VGS for different uh, input signals. That's why over here is this paper published in 1999. That year you were born, you guys? 1999? 1997, since I, I had a student two years ago who graduated, he, he was born in 1997. So that's where this came from. For this NMOS transistor, we want to keep VGS a constant voltage. So which means whenever the source changes, I want to change the gate voltage as well at the same time. So VGS is a constant voltage, which is VDD. Okay, so that's the purpose over here. So how we can make it happen? Here, how, how that works. We have to add all these circuits to make that happen, right? So that's the purpose of it. You have to know the starting point, that's right here. If you do not use all the other ones, you just use a pass gate to do the sample and hold. It may still work, but the nonlinearity, the DNL and NLs will be really bad for your ADC. That's why we need a, a constant VGS always 
no matter what's a, what, what is the sample in, what's the input voltage is. Okay, so understand this point here is very important. So now let's look at that. Because this voltage changes can go, you know, up to like zero, uh, the range can be zero to VDD for this AC signal. Usually we do not have the, that large input voltage, but let's say it's zero to VDD input. And if you want to keep this VGS to be constant, what's the maximum VG you should supply to this point? What's the, what's the maximum VG should be made available for, for this pin to make sure whenever the input voltage is very high, like VD, for example, and you can still have a constant VGS, which is VDD. What's the gate voltage is? 2 VDD, right? So you have 2 VDD, even you have a VDD here, you still have a VDD VGS. Still have VDD as VGS, because 2 VDD minus VDD will be VGS, uh, will be 1 VDD. We are still not changing the VGS, still, still VDD, 1 VDD. All right, so that's how you can keep that VGS a constant over there, which is important. And now let's see here. <clears throat> So there's a high voltage, high voltage happening there. So that's why you need all these charge pumps. All right, for example, when clock is high, when clock here is high, what's the signal here? What's the voltage here? Low, the inverter, right? So when this one is low, this one is, uh, this is another inverter. So this pin is high. So it's actually adding a voltage to this, it's like a charge pump. Remember the voltage doubler we, we uh, simulated on Monday. So whenever there's an AC signal, it's not really AC, but it's a rising edge. Because whenever I'm pulling this, when pulling this uh, pin to the ground, it's actually pulling this pin up to VDD. Why? Because I got a V high here. Okay, whenever this is changing, it's an AC signal which is able to pass what? The cap. So on the other side of the cap, you are seeing a rising edge from zero to VDD. <clears throat> so what's gonna happen is, because here is voltage low, right? Here is high, here is low. That's why when I turn this on, this NMOS will be on and charges will be dumped to here because the other side of the plate is low, right? I mean, it doesn't matter, but it's low. Even though it's not low, it's still going to dump charges to the other side of the plate. So when this is being turned on, you know, I have a pretty strong voltage source on the top. It's going to dump charges to the plate. Or you can say this, pin, this point here is being pulled up to VDD. I'm getting a voltage high over here let's say VDD minus VTHN, right? Very close to VDD. Which will turn this guy on. Okay, so the next cycle, the next cycle when this clock becomes low, this becomes high. And because it, the charges has nowhere to go, these are all the gates. And it used to store VDD over here. Now I got another VDD trying to bump it up even more. It's like a voltage doubler. So what's the voltage here will be? I already have a VDD there. And now that charge has nowhere to go, right? And now I'm adding another VDD at the from the, from the bottom. So I'm gonna bump the top VDD to two VDD. It's adding up. It's like a voltage doubler, which I simulated on Monday, right? If you couldn't imagine like why, you know, just show, just do it on simulation. You will see that it's actually doubling. All right. 
So you are getting two VDD, very close to two times VDD at this point. So and this one is being shorted to this gate as well. So that's why whenever you get a two VDD over here, it's going to turn on this NMOS fully on, even more than fully on, because here is one times VDD, here is two times VDD. That's why you can pass the entire VDD to this point. Does that make sense? Why? Because if you only have one times VDD at the gate, you cannot transfer the whole VDD to this point because there will be a VTHN loss. You are getting lost, aren't you? Um, so let's draw one thing on paper here. <laughs> Requires a lot of experience, yeah. You don't want to become an electrical engineer after this. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge yourself. It's so slow here. So here's a V high. So if I want to pass V high, which is VDD, to here, and I only turn on this NMOS using a VDD to the gate, can I pass the entire VDD to the source? And why why I cannot do that? Why is that won't work? No, so for example here, when when we have VDD here, and the purpose right now is to pass the whole VDD to this point, it's just like uh, treating this channel as a as a wire, so it's sending this whole VDD to this point. So let's just think about that. I just start turning this on from zero. When it's off, then nothing is going to be sent to here, right? But now I start turning it on, and this takes time, like this. Okay, I start turning on the gate. When I'm turning, when I'm t when when I turn on the gate, during this time frame, VD will be gradually transferred to here. So the voltage here, starting from zero or nothing, start rising, right? So there's, there will be a, a process for this one, starting from zero to VDD. So when this start rising. Once it reaches VDD minus VTHN, what's going to happen? That's the source, right? VS. This is VG. So VGS equals to VDD minus equals to VTHN. All right. 
So VGS must be larger than VTHN in order to turn on the channel. However, after this one, the source reaches VDD minus VTHN. It starts shutting off the NMOS. So the voltage cannot keep rising. It's going to stop at this voltage. So you are getting a VTHN loss. So you're not getting VDD. So how can I get a VDD here? So, so right um, increase the gate voltage, right? So for example, I give a 2 VDD over there. And now I have more room for, for it. So if I turn on this gate at 2 VDD, then I will be able to transfer the whole VDD to here, right? Because even though here is a VDD, I still have a VT, uh, VGS as VDD. It's way larger than VTHN. So that, that's why this NMOS is able to transfer the whole DD to the source. So that's the whole point here. I mean, the reason we need the high voltage here is because we want to transfer the whole DD to this point. The whole circuit on this, uh, on this side is a circuit to provide that high voltage, which is 2 VDD. That's it. Looks complicated, but actually it's not. Very simple. Just providing a two, two VDD to this gate of this NMOS. So it is able to transfer the whole VDD to here. Okay, so you are getting a floating VDD for this uh, capacitor. So one times VDD will be added to this cap. And whenever I disconnect this NMOS uh, or shut off this NMOS, so you are getting a float, like a battery, it's a floating DC voltage across this cap. So that's why whenever this sample voltage comes in and goes through this NMOS and reaches here, so it's going to bump that VDD on the top up. You know what I mean? So it used to be a constant VDD on the top. And now, because this is varying, so whatever this pattern is, it's going to be added to that DC voltage here. So that's why it's, it's, it's tracking, it's tracking that uh, AC input. However, it's getting a constant VDD difference over here. And that VDD difference will be added, it's going to go through this PMOS and to be added to the, to the gate of this uh, pass gate of this uh, uh, NMOS. You know what I mean? So the gate voltage will be VDD plus V signal. So that's the final pass gate. Here's the sample in, right? Here's V out. This is VS, that's a signal, not source voltage, right? It's a V signal. So what's VGS? It's constantly VDD for the VGS. So that's the, the whole purpose of this circuit, right? Okay, let's move forward. Not talking about this tracking hole anymore. Torching you. <laughs> and... So this is the old pamp I, I found from the, the, the textbook. This uses the 50 nanometer technology on the, the model file on the textbook. You can directly use it. You don't have to modify anything on that. And here's a biasing circuit, which provides the DC voltages to bias these analysis. And if you want to do analysis for, for this uh, OPAM circuit, it requires some calculation for the DC current of the NMOS and PMOSes. It takes another week or two, so we're not doing that. We just treat this op-amp as a black box. We just use it. It's going to be a comparator. 
right? Just directly use it. And here's the star logic. So if I zoom in, every single T flip flop is, uh, I'm not showing that, is this guy, the TI's set and reset T flip flop. All right, you have to build it yourself and make it into a box like this. Um, right? And then make the connections. So we have provided the schematic of this star logic in some of the lecture notes, right? We have gone through this for a few times. But this is a larger scale because it has eight bits. So when you need eight bits for the star, you need a nine stages. Just keep in mind. The reason you need the nine stages is because you need the last stage here to send a clock signal to the previous one. So whenever the, the first uh, one, the MSB at the very beginning is being shifted to here, you can still have a clock to shift it out. So it has the last one, uh, the, the ninth bit to hold that little one here. So that one came from here. And so, for example, at the very beginning, right, at the very beginning, here's a quick quiz question. Just keep in mind, it may, may appear on some of the quizzes in the future, right? So, to start a conversion, do we need to give this pin a 1 or a 0 for the conversion? Think about it and tell me why. Why is that? So this pin reset here, that signal is being shorted to the set pin of the D3 fob and the reset pin of all the other D flip flops. The only, so this is only shorted to the set pin of the first one. So let's see, if I give a zero to this pin, what's gonna happen? So all the D flip flops are re responding to a zero or a one to, to the set and reset. Zero. It just look at the circuit, the D flip flop circuit with all the NAND gates. Okay, so whenever you give a zero, it's going to trigger that set or reset. Okay, depends on uh, where it's uh, being connected to. So when this pin is zero, it's going to trigger the set function of this D flip flop. And what does that mean? Yes. So what what about output over here? If I set it, what is Q? Because it's very fundamental. You guys need to respond to it in a second. No, if I set it, one. If I reset it, zero, right? Keep in mind, that's just the term, terminology in there. I set it, one, reset, zero, right? Even though I name it as reset, it's being shorted to the set of the first one and also being shorted to the reset for the, all the following ones. So let's see why, why I have to do that. Okay, if I give a zero, so I'm getting a, so this is the first D flip flop is being set. So I'm getting a one here. This is a Q naught, so this is zero here, right? So zero here will do what? We'll reset this D flip flop. So what is this output? One. Okay. Still, zero here, zero here. It's gonna reset this thing. It's gonna reset this, this guy. So if I reset this guy, I'm getting a zero here, and one here, and one here. So is one doing anything to this D flip flop? No. 
one is not affecting anything. Remember, the, the P flip four has all the NAND gates. And if you have an input for the NAND gates, it's not affecting its memory. It's not affecting anything. It's not changing anything. So it used to be zero because I haven't changed anything. It's going to be still zero. And same for the, all the other DP flops. So I'm getting a one, zero, 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 zero all the other ones. So I'm getting an initial state for the SAR algorithm, which is one and all zeros at the very beginning for the, for the conversion. Remember? That's how to do the conversions, right? So the very beginning, you need a one and all zeros. All right. So you can get started. So what's next? How did you get that one and all zeros? You need to give a give a reset of what? Zero. Okay. Next, I cannot hold it at zero all the time because I need to do the conversion. I don't want the output to be one zeros all the time. So I have to release it, right? I have to release it. So I have to give reset of what? A one. Okay. So the D55 will be functioning in the next cycle or the, all the following cycles. And also one will be applied to these ones as well. So it's not resetting all these other ones. So all the different flops are, are released. So start functioning as a memory or register. Okay, I'm not going to explain all the details of this SAR since we have done that for a few times. So the comp, comparator's output will be sent to here. And that's why every time you can plug in, this will be shifted to the left, uh, to, the, to the right here. It's being connected to all the other ones as well. So the comparator's output is being plugged in to each position every time because the one, little one here is being sent. It's being shifted to the right. So it's actually sending a one to each of them. And this is being used as a clock to trigger that, to send that comparator's output to here. I mean, you have to sitting there and, you know, looking at the circuit to think about the process in your mind by yourself. But it's just listening to me, it's confusing you and it's not helping too much. Okay. So what are these buffers over here? We didn't have these buffers in our class, but now these are added to here. I'm pretty sure they are not super critical compared to other components of the circuit. But however, because they have, the buffers are nothing but two inverters, so the signals are being inverted and then inverted back. So it's not changing anything. So whatever here will be sent to here as well. But it has two pathways to VDD. It's adding more pathways to VDD, so it's able to source more current from the other two voltage sources, uh, the VDDs, and also dumping current to the grounds. That's why it's actually increasing the driving capability of every node. So that's why it's because there are so many stages. That's why it makes sense to adding more buffers to so be able to source currents from VDD and dump currents to the to the ground at every single stage more efficiently to decrease the delay time for each stage. If you do, don't add all the buffers, the circuit will still work in the same way. It won't, won't be affected as that much, but the time delay probably will be a little bit longer. Okay, that's the SAR. That's a buffer. All right, and make the SAR block, the circuits into the box and run the simulations. You have to demonstrate, you have to simulate every single component in the SAR ADC in, in your report. You have to show the similar stuff like this. And let's take a look at this waveform, see if that makes sense. Comparator's output. I just generated a pulse signal. Um, it's sometimes it's one, sometimes it's zero. It's not an ADC conversion. I just feeding that comparator's output um, to the SAR. Okay, it's a fake one. 
<clears throat> and here's a clock to the star. Here's a reset signal, the one we just talked about. Okay, so to start a conversion, you need to give a reset a what? At the beginning, zero. See here? Oh, kills me. <clears throat> Have to give a zero first. So it's gonna um, provide a what, what kind of binary data pattern to the output. See the output seven, which is MSB, until output zero, which is LSB. All right. What's the signal pattern if you reset everything? One all zeros, right? And now let's take a look at it. This is one and all zeros, right? And then if you want to start a conversion, you have to release it. So that's why you need the uh, uh, high voltage here after a while. And whenever reset is high, it is able to respond to the clock. So let's see the first one. So I have to look at the first rising edge after this reset pin is being released to voltage high. So wh where is the first uh, rising edge? Here. So whenever after this is this becomes high, there's just a little time difference, but this is after this was put uh, put up to voltage high, right? So whatever as this rising edge rising edge from the comparator will be plugged into the SARS output. Is that correct? Yes. You start working, right? This is everything got started already. So this rising edge, I'm going to sample this count, comparator's output, so which is one. Okay? So one will be sent to here. Which is wrong. <laughs> no, one is being plugged into here, remember? So the, all the stars. The MSB is plugged into the first place, to the MSB, right? So the first data. And what is this one? It's the original one, you know, after the reset. So that one was being shifted until it's, it's gone. Okay? So this one will be shifted to here, and you plug in the comparator's data to here. Okay? And then the next rising edge here, Sample the what? Still a one. See? Still sample the one for the comparator's output. And it's going to plug in that one to where? A very quick quiz question. Keep in mind, you need to know that. Where is that one being sent to? Here? Here, here, right? Next, boom, comparator is off with zero. It's gonna sample a zero and send plug into here. And the original one was shifted to here, right? You have to demonstrate that all the process until the last uh, state. And so you can tell from the, all the data points for the outputs, and the output, the converted result is one, one, zero, one, zero. So one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. Okay? And that combination is, is uh, literally the comparator's output if you combine all the digits together. And now let's take a look at it. One one zero one zero zero one zero. One one zero one zero zero one zero. Okay. So where is the original one? Huh? Shift it out to here. So I have to run the simulation to show the SAR algorithm works. 
That's how you implement it in digital circuits, okay? It's a very amazing circuit, is it? I mean, it's, you can implement something just using transistors. And you build everything from scratch. It's not like other, when I was in, in, in graduate school, we just use a gates, but we don't know what's happening in the gates. And you start building everything from NMOS and PMOS, so you understand what's going on in there. You know, start from, so you are not like starting from sands, right? You are not going to Nevada to collect some of the sands from the desert and make the sands into silicon wafers and then go to TSMC's foundry, you know, dope this N plus P, P plus onto the wafer and making the silicon chip and then make ADC out of sands. It's not necessary, We're, but you know, the very bottom level we are dealing with is just transistor level which is good enough. I mean, you, you guys can understand, you know, from the transistor level, but not the physics level, which is not required, all right? Now, uh, R2R DAC, just use a, do you need a quiz on this? Another quiz on R2R? <laughs> Superposition? No, I hate it. Timing, which is the uh, brain of the ADC, very important. So there are several blocks for the timing. <laughs> they are sending different commands to the ADC. Very top is a counter here. Okay, so the counter, you know that at the very beginning, if you feed a four megahertz clock uh, signal to the clock here, then the Q is gonna output the two megahertz. It's being divided by two, okay? It's very simple simulation. You can simulate it uh, in Altispice very easily. You will see that the frequency is being divided by two. And the frequency is being divided by two for each, for each uh, different flop being connected in this way. So you have one, two, three, four, five. So eventually, divided by two, two megahertz, one megahertz, 500,000 megahertz, and 250k hertz, and 125k hertz. And, um, you know, the inverters are, you know, have to add an inverter to make it work in the correct way. So they have to simulate it. We don't want to just do it on the paper. It takes time. Not necessary. Just counter will be the same structure always. So the output are here. You have to be inverted to make the correct outputs over here. So these are the outputs of the counter. And the reason we want to use the output, we want to connect the output to somewhere is because if you have one, two, three, four, four bit as a counter, so what's the number it's going to count to if you do not control it before it resets itself? becomes all zeros, right? Start from all zeros, definitely. Then comes to one, two, three, four, until one. It's gonna reset itself to zero. So we are, for example, we are not looking at the first one, just looking at the two megahertz, right? So for example, this is generating a two megahertz signal and we got four bits over here. So for four bit counter, What's the maximum number it is able to count to? 15. So after 15, it's going to reset itself. It's not actually resetting, it's just the overflow, right? So it's getting a carry out. So all the other bits will be one, will be zeros, and there will be a carry out. But since you don't have another register to hold that carry out, so it just seems like all the other things are zeros, right? It's just like reset itself. But we do not want to count to 15 because it's just a waste of time. So what's the number we're gonna to count to for the star conversion? We have eight bits. So we need a nine cycles, nine states. Right, so we run, we're gonna to have to run it for nine times. And the tenth time, it's gonna send out everything. All right, so we need, we need a 10 cycles. So this one was set to nine. 
is there going to be a problem? So clock door, right? The door is like, whenever the data is ready, I'm gonna open the door and let the data out, and then close it, and then keep doing the, the other nine cycles, and then open the door and send it out, right? But to control it, we'll have to control it, because if you look at the overall circuit on the top, so that's the ADC, like what's the input and what's the output of the ADC? Whenever you are looking at the circuit, analog, digital, doesn't matter. You have to look at, you have to think about the input and output, in and out. Okay, what's the signal it's receiving and what's the output it's giving to the outside world. Here's the input, right, it's analog input. Where's the output? Can I directly just use the SARS 8-bit parallel digital output as the output? Why? The analog signal comes in, sample and hold is going to sample all this data, right? It's going to sample all of them, sample it, and hold it. And whenever the, the, that data point is being held during that period, it's being converted. For how many cycles? Nine. Okay? So which means there will, when you are drawing that nine states on the paper, you have nine circles, right? So every circle has a... Digital value have a voltage, have an analog value. That's why you need a calculator to calculate them. So you have uh, one initial value, one completed value, and seven intermediate values. And this a bit parallel uh, line lines, the bus has no control over the intermediate values. So they are outputting all the values, starting from one zero, one all zeros, to any of them. It's gonna appear here. So they are not the final products, not always. So it has the final products, but the whole has all the other eight um, incomplete values you don't want to use. So you cannot directly use these eight parallel pins. As the output, if you directly connect these A pins to a Mac controller or something, it's going to have all the other values as well at the same time, but only one of them is correct. Okay? So that's why you need a door. And to count it, whenever it reaches 9, you trigger it, send it out. Otherwise, just don't do anything. Right, so this door register has nothing but eight D three flops. I right? just connect all the pins to the D pin of the D three flop, and whenever it comes to nine, boom, trigger it, send it out to here. A quick question. <clears throat> Do we need a DAC here for the ADC? So do we need a DAC here in the chip for the ADC chip? Why? Yeah. <laughs> right? ADC is A to D. We got a D here already. We're done with it. It's done. So why do we need a DAC here for the simulation? Test the output. See if we can recover it. So we get a sound wave, it's continuous analog input, and we convert it to a digital output. It's very difficult to show it. You have to add, keep like, right click, add a plot pin, add a plot pin eight times, and can only plot the digital signals. They cannot see what's going on there. I have to calculate for every single point. So convert it back to analog so you can see if they matches each other, right? Okay. 
Another question. <clears throat> Look at stamp and hold circuit over here. Here's a V in. Here is a stamp and hold output. All right. If we just look at circuit here, right? As then compared to whatever you know another student did in the past. So that's the analog input. That's the ADC's output. I mean, the problem for this one is because the input signal frequency is too high. That's why the sampling rate is not high enough to resolve every single point. If you make the input signal slower, you know, you can actually track it really well. But let's just look at this one, for example, okay? I'm getting an input and I'm getting an output has all the stars, okay? So that's the output of ADC and then be connected to the DAC. So I'm getting this, the purple line is the output from the DAC, okay? And now let's get the output of the sample and hole. <clears throat> it's even better than the ADC's output. Why do we bother using all the circuit, the SAR and everything to get a star purple line instead of just using a sample and hole output? Yeah. Does everybody get it? Get that? We need eight parallel pins. This star over here is still analog voltage. Okay, it's not digital. It's still one pin. I need eight pins with one and zeros, not like one pin with the stars. Okay. Okay. It's good to know you understand that, and then let's come back to here. Timing, okay. Is there going to be any issues if I count to nine instead of ten to trigger the door? Do you know where's the door? Still remember where's the door? Right before the output, but after the star. Okay. If I count to nine, so this is a combination logic. So whenever this input becomes 1001, zero, zero, one, which is 9. It's going to output a 1 here, right? So it's a counter comes to 9 and trigger that clock for the register, 8-bit register. Is that a problem? And why? <clears throat> How many cycles do I need to make the the good data writing nine cycles and will that be a problem if i just trigger open the door at nine yeah. from the eighth cycle okay so actually this circuit although it's it tracks you know for this single sound wave is one period compared to this one yes i slowed down the the peer, the, the frequency of the input and you know, did I tell you how, how long it took me to simulate the one cycle? One hour. <laughs> That's why I can see all the points. It tracks. So our actually our A bit star is not really bad. If you look at this one, it's, it's awful. It, it's not converting the analog voltage at all. Why? You could look at that. For the whole, it's like 50% amplitude, only has two stars. Only have two points being resolved. Oh my goodness, it's not ADC. It's like I can manually do it even better than this. What's the reason? The input frequency is too high, and your sampling frequency is not high enough to capture that. So look, so this one, you know, do you know, I didn't show the time scale over here. So the time scale here for every division is like in a nanosecond level. You look at here, what's the, what's the time? Like 0.1 milliseconds, right? So it's way slower. That's why my, so our, not my, our SAR ADC, a bit SAR ADC is able to resolve all the points. It's tracking the input. Okay. Looks fine, but if you do the NL DNL analysis, you can find out, I think. I haven't done that. I just found this issue a couple of days ago. And it's, it's up to you guys. I mean, I highly recommend you guys to try it. Change this to 10. Okay. You know, make it wait for one more cycle, which is fine. I mean, it's not going to slow down everything too much. Just wait until 10. Not nine, 
is required, right? I have to do it. Our D3 flops are a rising edge trigger. And it's gonna it's gonna affect a lot of things because we are using a rising edge trigger D flip flops everywhere. And if you have a falling edge trigger, then other timings, other uh, you know clock generators probably have to be changed as well. Just for the door. to think about it can be a good point right good thing to think about all right you, you will try it and let me know so that one comes to nine i want to change it to ten so this one has to be changed as well because right now it's counting to ten okay it's counting to ten so i want to count this to eleven instead of ten if i change this to ten and this has to be, this has to come to 12. <clears throat> so this is resetting this clock. And I also think it's not necessary. Why? Because after it comes to um, 12, it's going to reset itself, is it? It's not. So it's necessary, actually. You have to count, you have to you have to reset yourself. You have to reset. So after this comes to right now is eight plus three is eleven. You have to count count this one to twelve to clear to clear all to clear up all the counter to make it to zero. Start count, counting from zero. Right. So that's a that's the brain of the star DC. Okay. They're providing all the cycle all the timing the pulses. And now let's take a quick look at this one. <laughs> so this reset is a signal we talked about, <laughs> which is this reset. So whenever it's low, it's giving a one and zeros. Whenever it's high, it starts a conversion. So that's why I need a this high voltage high to do the conversion. And I need a how many cycle rising edges? 10. So 9 for the conversion and 10 to kick it out, right? What about this one? I have to create a signal. So this is just from the counter. It's very easy from the counter. The clock is going to count, count and make this happen. So we have to make this as well. So this is simply just the inverted signal from, the, from here. And why it's just a simply inverted signal from this one. If you look at the sample and whole circuit, I need to do the conversion during which time period. Keep in mind, this is not uh, where one hope, right? You don't want to change the DC input whenever you are doing the conversion because this time it's 5 volts and next time it's like 4.8 volts. What's the number you are converting, right? I have to hold it constantly at a constant voltage. So everything has to be done over here. What's the, what's the voltage of the sample and hold clock? Zero. See? Where is high? Here is high. Here is zero. So the sample and hold has to be zero. Just make it zero. Okay, so the sample hold is going to hold it, not sampling, it's hold, holding. And whenever it is resetting the star, let's sample it. So not wasting time. What about the door? The door rising edge will kick that a bit parallel output out, right? It needs to happen before you send for new data. Still holding that, then I send it out. And then I 
get a new data sampled. Okay, I think uh, we are pretty much done and there will be a few questions to ask you next time and um, expect the quiz on Friday, okay, for any of the things I covered today. Okay. So the best way to prepare it is to download that LT Spice on the top of the page, download it and run it, play with it. Okay? And watch the video as well, or watch the lecture. <laughs>